Welcome to the Consulting Success Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Zapersky. In this podcast, we'll dive deep into the world of elite consultants, where you'll learn the strategies, tactics, and mindset to grow a highly profitable and successful consulting business. Hey, it's Michael Zapersky, and today I'm very excited to have Shubir Chowdhury joining us. Shubir, welcome. Oh, my pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, so for those who aren't familiar with your work, just take a moment and explain what you do. Yeah, I literally wear so many different hats, but my major thing, what I do day to day is basically a management consultant. I help all types of organizations uh, from Fortune 100 companies to all the way to a tiny little hospital, you know, all types of organizations in process improvement and quality. And literally what it is, is basically I make the organizations more effective. And by doing the process improvement initiative, we literally save billions of dollars to different types of companies. Right. And I was going to say, like, you're known as a real thought leader in the quality and Six Sigma movement. You're also the CEO of ASI Consulting Group, where you've worked with and consulted for organizations like Bosch and Kia, P&G, Xerox, many other Fortune 100 companies that people would know of. But before we kind of explore where you are today, I want to take everyone back and really understand how did you get actually into the business of consulting? <laughs> it's kind of weird the way I came into the consulting and let me tell you a little bit how. So basically, I graduated from Indian Institute of Technology, which is kind of IIT in India, one of the most prestigious schools in India in aerospace engineering and in 1989. And after I graduated in aerospace engineering, and you know, I live, my first job is in Apple computers in Bangladesh, in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And uh, so over there, Apple is just entering the market and nobody literally knows how to even use the Apple computer because it, they are just entering the market in 89 in Bangladesh. So when I joined, basically, I got a Macintosh and they said, Shubir, you have to kick out IBM out of the market and try to sell this device and you have to self-teach yourself. So I literally played with the machine and kind of, I was 21, 22 years old and literally learned everything on my own and then going to different organizations and using the, at that time, it was very popular what perfect and all those Microsoft DOS operating systems and all. So that is the way I initially, my first two years before I came to America, uh, that I've been working everywhere to sell the Apple system and then teaching them the Apple, how to use the Apple and everything else. So, uh, so that is the way I started my first job in my career. And then after two years, I came over here. But one thing happened within that two years, because even though I was not a consultant, but I kind of acted as a consultant, right? I acted kind of as a, because I'm trying to sell these systems to all these different companies like US Embassy, the different government organizations in Bangladesh, a lot of American companies based in Bangladesh at that time about the Apple. So a uh, so couple of things really stand out in my career was what I found that why people literally like Shubir Chaudhary. And even at that time, I was 21. All my customer loves me, right? So one of the things what I found out is that communication, because at all level, I try my level best how to communicate with the richest of the richest or the poorest of the poor equally. Similarly, how can I communicate with the Fortune 100 CEO as well as an assembly line worker effectively, right? So communication is the key. So that is the one thing I found out, even though without knowing, but I kind of parked in my brain that this is the one thing I kind of enjoyed dealing with the people, advising them. And trying to, so that, that is my experience. Then I have a two year gap on a sense that I worked, I literally did my master's degree in, in the US. I came to US in 91, finished my master's in 93. And then after I finished my master's in 93, I got my first job in GM, you know, in General Motors mm -hmm. as an engineer. So when I worked there for 93 to 97, like 96, three years when I was working there, one of the things what's happening was to me was I was coming up with some ideas. So out of the box ideas I was coming up with inside of GM, these GM people are thinking I was crazy. And so a lot of them are thinking, what the heck you are, you know, you're trying to come up with, you know, these are, it, you are working for a co company, big corporation, you have to please your boss, you're, you know, you don't try to cross the line, but I was doing everything out of the box, right? And trying to again, go back because naturally, that is my nature. I kind of felt that what they are doing is stupid. I have to come up with something. And then I wanted to come up with a complete idea, giving the solution to them. Mm -hmm. The problem is that nobody is trying to listen and implement it. And in fact, they are trying to put me on the sideline. That was the time 
And one of the idea was at that time, the idea was, which will kind of make sense, you know, in America, we have GM, Ford and Chrysler, three major automakers at that time. And I'm talking about in 93, 94, right? Now there's a lot of other companies coming up, but main organizations, GM, Ford and Chrysler. My idea was why all of them has a three different quality standards. Why can all of them collectively can have a one common quality standard? That was my curiosity. As a young guy, don't know anything. So my curiosity is, if they are the all three companies, so for an example, if you supply a part, identical parts to GM, Ford, and Chrysler, you as a supplier has to fill out three different, meet the three different quality standards. That doesn't make any sense. So if you do that, even for the paperwork, as a supplier, you put your price tag into it, so the cost will go up if they have to meet three different standards. But I kind of talked with a lot of suppliers and asked them if we can make that even a one common standard. And then when I told that to GM, GM said, they are our competition. You don't have to, you know, you don't talk about that. So they are trying to, see. that was the time, one of the kind of a middle manager advised me, saying, this weird. some of your ideas are so out of the box. If you really wanted to make a dent, why didn't you go out and get involved with American Society for Quality or American Action, uh, Automotive Industry Action Group or Society of Automotive Engineers? These are all nonprofit professional society. Why don't you get yourself involved into those as a volunteer? There is no boss there. And you continuously make noises and talking about your ideas and somebody will listen. And that's the ex- Is that what you did? That's what I did. And guess what? When I did that, based on that, ultimately, automotive industry, there's a new standard called QS9000. I was one of the pioneers on that. My first book was published. And when I was conducting, when I brought GM, Ford, Chrysler, all leadership together and trying to tell them, you have to all work together to come up with a one common standard. And we are going to help. And all of our volunteers is going to help. And that's what I did. And then somebody in one of the conference, one of the lady, and at that time, I didn't even write even one book. One of the lady kind of looked at, you know, came to me saying, Shmir, the way you conducted is amazing. But how these companies, all these suppliers, there's a 40,000 suppliers. How the heck they will get certification? Where is the booklet? Where is the other stuff? And I said, everything in my brain. He said, okay, then you have to write a book about it. I said, I never wrote a book. He said, don't worry about it. Long story short, Ultimately, she persuaded me and she became one of my lifetime very good friend of mine. So I immediately came up with a new the book called The QS9000 Pioneers. Even when I was still in GM, as soon as that book came out, I was literally making at that time maybe 55, 60,000 US dollars at that time as an engineer, senior engineer inside of GM. Mm-hmm. As soon as the book came out, immediately those different companies are calling me and saying, hey, we wanted to pay you 3,000 a day. And the problem is I didn't have a green card at that time. So I cannot even quit my job. Anyway, the long story short was when the book came out, what I did, I also sent the book to the manuscript to the people who are the absolutely the top in the field in quality, like Philip Crosby, like J.D. Power, like Dr. Taguchi. These are the giant in quality. And all of them are 70 plus at that time. And I was 27, 28 myself. And the good news is, not only every one of them, like none of them I knew, but I always believed in American dream. So I just wrote to them. So they didn't reply. I wrote to them again. I didn't give up until they replied. So ultimately, long story short, they all reviewed the book. And not only that, all of them came, all of them, even Dr. Taguchi from Japan, Philip Crosby, Dr. J.D. Power, all of them came to Chicago in American Society for Quality Congress, 50th Congress, to launch my book, right? Now, I was thinking about it. I was only 27 or 28 years old. All these people, they spend their own money to come and launch my book. And that is the only book till today is written, which was endorsed by every single quality guru, right? So guess what happened? By the time when they flew in and J.D. Power, one of the iconic figure in automotive industry, saying that what should be did, he basically made a big dent in the automotive industry to make all of them to have a harmonized one standard. And this is basically his quote. Quote is about that he will be the new voice of quality of the automotive industry, right? That's what he told me, right? At that time. So Shabir, it sounds like that on the back of everything that you just went through, which is there's so many lessons in there that I think that we could pull out, but that's really what you say, that's what led to your first consulting client. Yes. Like, so then what happened after the book came out, then even not only that, even then these mentors having a fight 
to who can hire me, right? All of them offered me job as a consultant. And when I met with JD Power, I still remember the day when I met with JD Power on the day of my book launch for a breakfast. He asked me, he said, Shabir, what do you want it to be? He asked me that question. So I said, I want it to be like you. He said, what do you mean by that? Explain to me. I said, you know what is good quality, what is like, you can say what the customer is telling you, what is good quality, what is bad quality. But if I tell you to transform a bad quality into good, you don't know because you are a marketer. You are just reporting what is good, what is bad, whatever the customer told you. But if I tell you how to transform the bad into good, you don't know how to do it. He said, no, I don't. I said, guess what? I wanted to be known for that. He said, great idea. So he said, then what the hell are you doing in GM? I said, I cannot quit right now. He said, hey, should be look, as soon as you can legally quit, immediately quit, and you start your consulting. Because look how much demand you already created. So, you know, the good news was that that was the same time because of my book and all the recognition I received. Based on that, I received in Stanley and kind of a instant green card from the, through the US Congress and everything. So I, as soon as I received that, then immediately I quit. I joined my organization, which is one of the founded by Dr. Deming and Dr. Taguchi, was the founding father. And they were initially, I joined the organization, it's called, it is stand for American Supply Institute, which is a, used to be a non-profit organization. Within two years of joining the organization, I transformed the organization so much, basically said, you know, the board of directors saying that, Shibir, you are running this as a big for-profit, big consulting. I said, yes, that is my dream. So, and that was the time I wanted to even quit and start my own company. And that was the time this, the, all the employees of this nonprofit wants to join me. So that was the time I made a deal saying that, okay, let's just start this ASI consulting group. But I still kept the name ASI. So I'm one of the majority of the owner of the organization. And should be a question for you here. Do you think like... Going back to when you were launching your book and you sent the manuscript to, you know, as you call them, the gurus, kind of the, the well-known yes. authorities in, in the industry, if you didn't continue to follow up with them, what do you think would have happened? Do you, do you think you still would have had the same outcome that you ultimately had? Nope. See, I think the most important, one of the things, and in fact, in my is talk to you, I'll discuss about it, that one of the things what I learned is that all is any consultant uh, profession, not only consultants, anybody, they should, any human being should have, think about in their mind, anybody can be reachable. Any human being, another human being, doesn't matter what their success matter, you know, successes are. Mm -hmm. And anybody can be reachable. And once you have that mindset, right, then what do you do? Because you have to have that strong mindset that anybody is reachable. Once you have the reachable target, then what do you do? You continuously knock their door and you never give up until that door opened. So guess what? Dr. De, even Philip, like J.D. Power or Crosby or Taguchi, they didn't know me. They are saying, so J.D. Power, they didn't reply initially. How many times do you think it took you to, to actually reach Oh, out? at least like in some of these people, like maybe 25, 30 times. Now, someone might be listening going, like, well, but Shabir, I can't do that. I would feel like I'm a nuisance. I would feel like I'm too too pushy, that I'm too salesy, that I'm making myself appear as desperate. So yeah, what's your mindset around that? Because I want to know what separates the mindset that you had that obviously is so powerful from those who create reasons not to take that consistent action? Because the reason is that because when you have to have the conviction that value proposition you are bringing in. So for an example, all the successful people, they wanted to see the, what you are trying to bring to the table. So if you bring something unique to the table, if it creates a value to other organization, or if it creates value to not only to the organization plus also to other human being, then successful people will notice that. So even if they tell me, so every time they ask my background, I said, that is the wrong question. You are asking the wrong question. You should ask me what I'm bringing to the table. I told them that, right? So then they said, okay, what are you bringing to the table? I said, okay, you can be the best in your field, but this idea didn't come from your brain. It came from my brain. And I wanted to validate with you. Can you give me some advice? So the real issue is that when you are trying to go, so even today, when I go, even after all my success, even if I go to in front of the client, even today, after all the Fortune 500 client success and everything else, is still any client I meet, it can be a quarter million dollar client or it can be a $50 million client. Any client CEO when I meet, first thing I ask them, what is their number one pain? Not my pain. What is their number one pain? And I become very truthful and tremendously 
thinking if I don't know it, if I don't get it, I continuously try to understand it better. If I feel that I cannot add value, I said, you know what? That is not my expertise. I don't want to be part of this. The real issue is even in consulting profession, I always talk about to the young consulting professionals. Consulting profession problem is 99.99% of the people, 99.99% of the people, they just try to sell their service. Mm-hmm. They are not thinking about, hey, do you know what? What value I can bring to my client and that value will drive and bring that money for me. I never, ever focused on money. Never, ever. But money followed me. I think that's such a great point because you're right. I mean, when you have a real conviction, when you are focused on the value, it's almost like you've identified a higher purpose, right? Beyond just engaging to talk about your offerings and doing business, you want to really make an impact. And you're right. I've had conversations with coaching clients about this. Those who really are focused on value and wanting to make a bigger impact are the ones that typically have greater success compared to those who are just trying to sell their services. Right. Like for an example, if I tell you, you'll not even believe this. If I tell you, I never in my whole life made a PowerPoint presentation or any wrote any proposal ever in my life. Never. Think about this. I never wrote a single proposal, okay? Proposal, proposal, or a PowerPoint presentation to do a sales deal, right? And I signed a quarter million to all the way to $60 million consulting deal. Think about that. One client, $60 million, six zero, right? My company, right? (laughs) Competing head to head with the big partner organization. And in one time, the one I own the $60 million contract, my competition, whoever submitted, these are all big five consulting firms. Their price is half of my price. Half of my price. Their price was 30 million. My price is 60 million. It's still clients signed with me. Why? And let me tell you the story why. Yeah. So uh, for an example, there is a particular organization. I don't want to tell the name of the client, but the particular organization came to me and said they want me to save them $2 billion in three years. So I said, hey, can I find $2 billion in your organization? He said, of course, you can find $10 billion waste in my organization. I said, okay. So after that, they want me to submit the proposal. I said, no, I don't do any proposal. He said, what do you mean? I said, I don't submit any proposal. I just write you an email or, or a one page and that's it. He said, what do you mean? We already got so many. I said, okay, go to them. He said, then, then what do you need to do? I said, because our CEO is very interested in you. I said, you tell your CEO that your CEO needs to meet with me face to face for 15 minutes. And then I'll submit whatever submit my price and what I'm going to do. So ultimately, this purchasing tried to bully me, tried to do everything. And they ultimately gave up and ultimately they went to their CEO and said that this guy you recommended, he doesn't want to submit any proposal. He said that only way he'll submit anything to us, including his pricing, after meeting with you for 15 minutes. And without that, he'll not do it. So ultimately, the CEO gave the meeting. So I flew from Los Angeles to all the way to East Coast to meet with the CEO. So as soon as I met with the CEO, the first thing the CEO asked me, Shmir, you came all the way from Los Angeles to meet with me and, and spending your money. I didn't pay you any penny. And you wanted to meet with me for 15 minutes. What is this 15 minutes all about? I said, look, I have to talk eye to eye, face to face with you so that I can understand so that then there is a deal between you and me. I said, okay. So what is the question? I said, I have a couple of questions for you that I wanted to hear from you, directly from you. I said, okay. So I said, do you have any children? And the CEO said, yes, I have two children. I said, okay, I have two children too. So I said, suppose your boy and my boy is in a life-threatening danger and you have to save only one. Which one are you going to save? Your boy or my boy? And the CEO said, of course, my boy. I said, thank you for your honesty. I'll do the same. So let me tell you this. So you understand that it is your baby. She said, yes. So I said, the reason, suppose if I, if you engage me, my firm and me to do this deployment for you, to save you $2 billion, is it your baby or my baby? Because you're writing me a check. So if you write me a $50 million check, you think that it will be your baby or my baby? The CEO looked at me and saying that, Shvir, that is your question. I said, yep. Said, Of course, it will be my baby. I said, you remember that. So when the baby is in danger, you have to step up, not me. I'm a consultant. I don't run your organization. So you have to be 100% committed at all time, 24-7. This is your baby, not my baby. I wanted to make sure that. So do I have a deal? 
And the CEO looked at me saying that, of course. I said, okay, my first sentence of my proposal you're purchasing is looking for would be the CEO of this organization said to me that this deployment would be hard baby. Said that will be my first sentence. So you remember that. Now, if you saying that you are going to write that, I said, yep. I said, do you have any problem? Because that's what we agreed. Today, at this time, on these days. And the reason I share that with you is that because what I do, unless the CEO is committed, if you ask me right now, like what I achieved for my client, I said, I didn't achieve anything. All the credit, 100% of my client credit is my client's credit. So, but what I do, I share this story. Now, this is the funny thing. Ultimately, I own that contract. And two years later, this CEO sat with me and told me when my purchasing came to me and said, hey, Shubir's price is 60 and his competition's price are 25 and 30. Why are you choosing Shubir? Do you know why, Shubir, I chose you? Because you mandated that it should be my baby. Mm. You meant, now, your competition did not meant, mandate it. It is my baby. So guess what happened? I thought, they didn't even request for a meeting from me. So they focused on my money. You focused on me and my success in the value. Ultimately, that client, I saved them 3 billion in 18 months. Think about this is very interesting. I have a three-year contract to save $2 billion. I saved $3 billion in 18 months and wash my hands. Think of what that tells you. No consulting firm will do that. No consulting because they focus on, because I have so much of demand for other work. I don't care because money is byproduct. When you say you wash your hands, what do you mean by that? The Consulting Success Podcast is powered by the Clarity Coaching Program. If you'd like to work directly with the Consulting Success team and receive personal coaching and support to optimize and grow your consulting business, marketing, and revenue, visit consultingsuccess.com to find out more and apply. That means I'm done with them. Basically, think about this. Majority of the consulting companies, what they will do in my position, they wanted to collect the fee at client's cost. I get my job done. And I told the client, hey, look, you guys are ready on your own. I already trained your people. You don't need me. I'm done. So what did you collect in the end? Do you still collect your 60 million? No, I got a $10 million bonus from them. So which is a pretty good bonus. So I collected almost maybe 45 million. Okay. And how did you get to that number? What was that initial even 60 million based on? Based on the saving of that $2 billion. So, okay. So it wasn't about the number of days and the number of hours. It was based No, no, no. On- of course, the number of days and number of hours is part of it. I calculated that part, how much effort. So I have 18 people full-time work on that client for right 18 months. So obviously all the mandates is calculated, but the thing is that there is a, some formula in a sense that our project might be a million dollar project, our project to save five mandates of my consultant's time is required. Mm-hmm. And so there is a complete formula based on that. So based on that, I came up with a budget of that 60 million. But the deal was once we solve the issue, once we are done, we don't need to. So your fees had the days and hours covered as, as the base, but did you, it sounds like, I just want to confirm, you had kind of an additional component or element to your pricing that was based on the value and the return on investment. Yes, you are absolutely right. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So if I saved them $2 billion, then they gave me a $6 million bonus, right? Then if I train their people and they become more self-sufficient, I have another component that they can have the right to use my material so because I already trained their people. So I train more than 1,000 of their people so they can use their, that material to train the rest of the 10,000 other people, right? Inside of that organization where they don't need a consultant because I train their people. We call it as a train the trainer so that they are completely certified on that, right? So it is a value proposition for the client, but I'm telling you, no other consulting firm in my position will do that. They will not walk away from another $15 million. But I felt that my job is done. I, I exceeded their expectation. So I'd rather collect my fee, you know, my bonus check, and that, and I move into the next client. Shabir, where does the confidence come from? I understand when you're having the conversation, you already have plenty of business, your pipeline is full, people are calling you. If this CEO doesn't want to comply or accept your terms of, of engagement, you know, no big deal. You have many others. But in the early days, when you were you know, not at the level where you are right now, your business wasn't as well known, you weren't as well known. Did you also have that level of confidence? I mean, it, it sounds like you, you never went in with a proposal. So where does that come from and why do you do it? The simple, because that is my belief. Because my belief is 
I believe as a consultant, my belief is that I always tell my colleagues, including even my clients, I talk about it. I can die for my client and I mean it. Mm. So I feel that conviction is there. So even this $10 million of a, depending on the size of the client, when that saving number is done, when I bring my team, I just tell them, hey, look, before you guys fail, just buy some gun and kill me, okay? That's what I tell them. I'd rather die because I cannot fail, right? So the conviction is so strong, right? So even a lot of the time, I push my clients so hard, right? And they just try to slow me down. And I just tell them, I said, no, because this will add value to your organization. So I need to, because my job as a consultant, I believe my job is to make my client successful at any cost, right? On ethical way, not unethical way, ethical way, right? So ethics is an absolute foundation, right? And that conviction is there. So even when I was nobody, like I was just starting my career, Mm -hmm. I still have that conviction. I have that. So I try to reach out to the customer and tell them. The other thing is that one of my very good friends, he's also one of the world's leader, number one leadership coach, Marshall Goldsmith. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he's uh, 20 years senior than me. So when I was 27, he's 47, right? He's 20 years older than me. So we became a lifetime friend. So when I was in that age, I reached out to Marshall and I asked him an advice. He basically said to me one thing so profound that changed my life. He said, she made the difference between a absolutely consultant, the client remember for life versus thousands of other consultants is they believe in themselves so much. The only thing they tell the client is the truth. Even if the client is so upset, still they tell the truth. So you might be humiliated. You might be thrown out. You might be, and very honest with you, at the beginning of my career, I was thrown out. I was kicked out. But at that time, I still telling the client, sir, you're doing a mistake. I'm sorry I could not convince you. I know you are throwing me out, but I'm just letting you know. Mm -hmm. Even if you come back three months from today, six months from today, or two years from today, I'll still die for you. Please remember me. When you fail, you please remember me. You come back to me. I will still try to give my life for you because I wanted to make a difference for you. So that, con- and so I had that, like I was kicked out. Literally, I was thrown out of Korea from Hyundai, from Korean automaker, literally thrown out. I was maybe 31, 32, thrown out. And then six months later, the chairman of the board, Hyundai said, I want Shubay, nobody else. So I said, my price became triple. He said, even if your price is five times, I still want you. Then I went back 15 years, they are my client and rest is history. I put them in the America's map. I made them one of the best in quality. They used to be one of the worst in quality. So the point I'm trying to make is that when you do as a consultant, as a profession, your goal should be that you understand my passion for it, right? I die for my client and to be very blunt and honest about it. And if you don't know, I always talk about it. Majority of the consultants, even not only the consultants, also the senior leaders, number one disease is Pretend they know something. I'm a consultant is that if I don't know something, I say, I didn't understand this. And sometimes they said, Shri, are you, what the heck you are talking about? You're one of the world's top experts. I said, people tell me I'm one of the top, world's top experts. That is people's problem, not my problem. I didn't still understand it. Please explain this to me. Right. So don't think that I know everything. If you think that you are paying me top dollars, I know I have all the answers, then you are doing wrong. What I'm good at as a consultant, I collect all the information, and analyze it properly, the more depth and understanding I have, then I can deliver better results for you. So that is also important that you need to be also very humble in front of your customer, right? You cannot come in. So even after writing 15 books with several bestsellers and everything else, even today, when I go in front of the client, I try to tell them I'm the dumbest guy in the room to a consultant like a, the Fortune 100 CEO asked me, saying that, what are you talking about? You're paying you so big. The one per day, you were telling me you had the dumb. I said, yep. I said, do you know how I got lucky? He said, how you got lucky? I said, I was so fortunate. I was working with your competition, with the other industry, all types of stuff. They enriched me so much. So I'm trying to share with you all of the knowledge I collected from different clients to share with you so that you can become more successful. So you are 10 times more smarter than me. Shabir, I want to dig into one thing here for a moment because I want to add as much value as I can for, for everyone and everything that you're sharing. First of all, thank you because I think there's just so much value and um, you know golden nuggets here. 
it sounds like from an early age, you had the conviction, you had the, the self-esteem, you had the confidence to be very direct, to be very honest. There's some people who don't, right? There's some people who, who struggle with that, who are listening going, yeah, I get what Shabir is uh, sharing with us, but I'm not confident to that level yet. I don't feel... I'm concerned that if I, I'm you know, very direct or if I engage the same way that, that I might get thrown out or there are all different things that might be going through people's head right now. So for those who maybe it doesn't come as naturally to, what would you suggest if you had to offer a piece of advice that could help someone to create that type of relationship? Right. Read more books. Every single day, make that as a, such a habit mm. to become a good consultant. Any book. I'm talking about any book. Read even fiction book more than even nonfiction book, okay? The reason is that because read poetry, because that brings the empathy. That fiction teaches you empathy, okay? So read those type of books because so you can empathize with the client, you know, more. Read so that more you read. I strongly feel that any good consultant should read at least two to three hours a day. Doesn't You have to figure it out the time. That's number one. Number two, once you read more books, then you develop more self-confidence. That's number one. I don't know how, but it happens. Mm. Trust me. Any book you read, your self-confidence will go up. Not overnight, but over time, you will develop more self-confidence. Number three, communication. Spend more time how to become a good communicator. Problem with the consulting field, almost 80% of the consultants I meet, they suck in communication. <laughs> when I mean by communication, mean it's not about the polished discussion. I'm not a... Don't think that I'm the polished guy. You know, it's not like that. I'm very authentic guy. Not necessarily like, look, I still have my own accent, right? I was originally born in Bangladesh. But it's still why the client loves me. Why client wants to hear? Because I'm very genuine. Be very authentic. Completely authentic. So if you are fearful, let the client know you're fearful. That is the authenticity. So think about it. Even myself telling I don't know, I don't know. So what the heck? I don't have any fear. Is rather to tell the client honestly and client will embrace because client is also a human being, right? So that is the other thing. So the other perspective is that try to find a mentor. Try to find in your field because consulting is so big field, right? There is all types of people might be your listener, right? In all different fields. So if somebody in your field, you figuring it out, like think about it. I didn't have any clue JD Power is going to ask the question. But when he asked that question point blank, then Shubir, I need to know what, who you wanted to be 10 years from today, 20 years from today, how you wanted to be known. So I told him, looking at his eyes, I said, I don't want to offend you, Mr. Power, but I wanted to tell you the truth. And he looked at me and he said, okay. I said, I wanted to be like you. He said, okay, that sounds good. But now you define, what do you mean by that? What do you be bringing different? Are you going to copy what I did? I said, no. So then I explained, it was so crystal clear. So you have to think, you know, the people who are struggling that, they also have to, I try to humbly request them. They should find the person in their field, whoever that person is. It doesn't have to be J.D. Power level. Try to find that person as a mentor because mentor makes a big difference. If you ask me today, what really helped me? Because I saw, nobody advised me. I did it on my own curiosity because I was very curious and I was hungry for knowledge. So what I did, I went to Dr. Taguchi, J.D. Power, Philip Crosby, and I was so hungry for knowledge. They gave it to me for free. Think about it. Like right now, if I find any young person who are like early 20s or even early 30s, they contacted me and say, I'm so, and obviously they have to knock the door 10 times. On the 11th time and say, okay, buddy, I got it. Hey, no problem. I wanted to talk to you. No problem. So if they really pass that, if they want my help, Absolutely. I mentor a lot of the other young kids. So I strongly feel that other professional that who are struggling on that level, they should find the right mentor whom they wanted to be, right? And try to develop the relationship. Because without that, like, you cannot become a consultant just sitting in your room. You have to become consultant to talk all types of people. So think about it. Even though when I've been walking on the street or whatever, I meet with somebody, I'm just talking to them talking about my ideas with them, sharing the ideas. Even if they tell me I'm the dumbest guy, that's okay because I have a thicker skin because I'm a consultant. So when I go to big corporation, there's a lot of internal politics, right? Lots of politics, but everybody likes me. Why? 
because I'm basically talking with them and having the relationship because I have an effective communication, right? I spend more time. If I go to any manufacturing organization, typically I fast request I make to them. I wanted to spend more time in the assembly line. I wanted to go there and check out their manufacturing line. And client is shocked. What do you mean by that? I said, that's what I mean. So I, I said, no, I don't need the company CEO. I'll be myself there. So I, then I took my team there and have some body discussion with the assembly line worker. And once they feel comfortable with us, they give us all the secret. They tell us what is not working. Then we can focus on that, right? But if I didn't have that communication skill, if I have that ego, I'm Shubhi Chaudhuri, I'm only meeting with the CEO, I don't go to the lower level, then I cannot be effective because it's the conviction of the value to the client. So I strongly feel that just to sum it up, I think number one thing would be you have to be very authentic and you have to read a lot of books. And then you also find a mentor, a person that you admire. You feel in your field one of the best. Now, the question would be, if you think, hey, Shri, that person is not reachable, absolutely will be reachable. Anybody's reachable. One day I was living in Michigan. This is 10 years ago. I suddenly dreamed that I wanted to do some real estate deal with Donald Trump, right? I'm talking about 10 years ago, right? Obviously, I reached him out. But I didn't do any real estate deal there. And, and ultimately, no answer, no answer, no answer. Finally, I got the answer. They said, okay, he doesn't want to sell me the land. And I wanted to buy the land from him in Los Angeles. And he said, no, I can only buy home from him and because he doesn't sell land. I said, no, because you cannot build as good quality as I can. So you sell me the land. So ultimately, what happened? Three years of negotiation. Ultimately, I end up with, he gave up and he, gave, he sold me the land. And later on, five years later after that, he came to my home to check and told me that I did the best home I built in his community, even better than what he built. And he said, no, you are right. And after that, after he became president from, with his son, I did two more deals. And why I'm sharing this, the reason I'm sharing this is anybody's reachable, anybody. Question is that how strongly you want them to reach. So I have a situation, you know, I have a situation at the beginning of my career. I'm talking about when I was 28, 29. I have a situation. I went to a senior leader. He gave some speech in a public speech, okay, in a public place. And he gave the speech and I started the client so much. And I noticed there's two or three things he said is not true. So guess what I did? After his speech is over, I somehow to excuse myself to go in front of him for two minutes. I just went to him and I just said that, sir, some of the three points you mentioned, your company doesn't practice that. And I have the data to show it to you. He was so shocked. So he said, okay, because he's in front of the journalist. He said, okay, give me your card. I'm going to see you after I'm done with this guy. So then he invited me. I went there. I talked with him and he was so shocked. He said, young man, you have the, I said, yes, sir. This is my data. He said, do you know what I want you to do? He's so good. I'm so impressed. I'm going to invite you to come to my senior leadership team. And to present this, what is your finding? Because you wanted to come to my lecture. So I went to listen to his lecture. I studied so much about the customer. So what I did, I studied means I read so much about the customer, reading, reading, reading. I found out what is their weaknesses and some of the things are not matching on his presentation. His presentation is portrayed, prepared by his subordinate, right? Somebody prepared and he is giving the, all the good thing. But there's, on the link, there's a lot of bad things what I found. I proved it to him. Then ultimately, he invited me to come to his, in front of his leadership team. I spent two hours with his leadership team. At the end of the day, I end up with a $10 million contract. <laughs> there we go. Well, Shabir, there's wonderful lessons in that and throughout everything that you've shared here today. I really want to thank you for coming on. But before we end, I want to ensure that people can learn more about you, more about your work, more about what your company's up to. So where's the best place for people to go? Uh, the best thing would be they wanted to know about it and I have lots of free information, completely free, a lot of videos and everything and a lot of articles. Is shubirchaudhuri.com is a spell S-U-B-I-R-C-H-O-W-D-H-U-R-Y.com. So shubirchaudhuri.com or that is my personal or my company information is about ASIUSA.com. A for Apple, S for Sam, I for India, USA.com. ASIUSA.com. You'll find everything about it or you just simply Google my name. Yeah, we'll have everything linked up in the show notes. But again, Shabir, thanks so much for coming on. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. For more episodes and to subscribe, rate, and leave a review, head on over to iTunes. 
And if you'd like to develop consistent lead flow and a highly profitable consulting business, learn more about our coaching programs at consultingsuccess.com. 